Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions, brought to you by AmericanManganeseInc.com. Here is Phil Mackesy. Author, entrepreneur, and blogger Garth Turner is back on This Week in Money. Garth's latest book is Money Road, Tools for the Wild Ride Ahead. And you can always find Garth's blog at greaterfool.ca. Hey, Garth, it's good to have you back. Thank you, Phil. Pleasure to be on the show. Biggest real estate news, uh, as you're pointing out, has to be that 70% plunge in new home sales in Toronto. The worst August number ever. This is a train wreck that uh, you've been predicting has been coming for some time. And it's finally here. Yeah, it is. And I think a lot of people were were kind of stunned by how the uh, how the numbers deteriorated. It really looks like demand is dried up uh, in large part. Uh, and you know, this is Toronto. I mean, this yeah. is not uh, these are not you know flaky granola eating people on the West Coast. You know, <laughs> this is supposed to be good, solid citizens here who don't get upset by things. But clearly, the the tables have turned and. Uh, there is a sentiment now certainly gaining ground, uh, particularly among first-time home buyers, that, you know what, Ottawa is serious about the changes they brought in. They don't want people borrowing. They're going to make it tougher and more expensive. And as a result, demand is going down. So I do think it is the first shoe that, that – that's dropping, and we're going to see more of this down the road, Phil. Now, we can't blame all of this on uh, poor Elfin Finance Minister uh, Jim Flaherty. What other factors are, are at play here, Garth? No, no, we can't. Um, that certainly is part of it. Uh, by killing off the 30-year mortgage and uh, you know destroying cashback mortgages and making borrowing standards higher, that's all part of it. But, you know, we've reached a price plateau, and I think people need to understand that you know, you don't need a disaster happening in the economy for the value of an asset to really top out. When people say there isn't value there anymore, this is too much debt. And when you've got first time home buyers who are now looking at the fact that it's going to cost them substantial money to buy as opposed to rent, um, I think there's a sentiment growing that, yeah, this thing can't last. Let's wait and see if prices come down. And the more that that sentiment exists, the faster the deceleration. We're really just in the early stages of it. And I think. 2013 is going to be one heck of an interesting year. Got an interesting uh, new report from the Conference Board of Canada. Who are these guys? Well, the Conference Board of Canada, yeah, they do do some good work, but they're basically a a think tank or an amalgam of pretty much establishment thinking. Uh, You won't get much avant-garde stuff coming out of these guys. So they tend to be pro-growth. Uh, pro um, pro real estate in general, and I've raised my eyebrows at a couple of forecasts they've come out with lately. I think they're way off the mark. It's all the more surprising they would say this. They are reporting a widespread decline in sales of existing homes in August. 21 of 28 metropolitan markets dropping. 16 markets, they say, down 5% or more. It doesn't sound like real estate pumping to me. Oh, well, that's just factual. They have come yeah. with a couple of forecasts where they think they're, it's going to be a quick rebound. That's where I take exception. I don't think this thing is going to quickly rebound at all. I think we're in the early stages of something that is actually going to be with us for a number of years. I've forecast for a while that we'll see maybe a 15% decline in national housing prices, which of course means maybe 5% in uh, you know Halifax and maybe 40% in Vancouver. But overall, it ends up being around 15%. But that's not the end. That is like chapter one of an ongoing saga. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I think we're going to see a pattern that we've seen in the United States. That is a, a quick drop, then a slow sort of erosion of real estate uh, values and it looks like a very dormant market. So there's plenty of time for people to buy in at lower values. I keep warning people, don't just get all excited now because you see prices go down uh, 10%. It's, uh, it's only the first uh, article of clothing dropping. The stripper's got a lot far, <laughs> further to go. This is what we call in the market a sucker rally. Yeah, it is, actually. Yeah. And you, we saw it in the U.S. again. Uh, 05, 06, we had the first quick drop. Uh, people piled in, and they got creamed because the market then went on to go down another 20 to 25% on average. And in certain markets, 
Vegas and and uh, Phoenix mm-hmm. and Miami and parts of California, we saw them go down. Prices go down another 50 to 60 percent. So you got to be very careful about when you time this. Were those the markets that had gone up the most in previous years, Garth? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And uh, there's no surprise there. The Sun Belt uh, states in the United States really saw the greatest appreciation right from Atlanta on down and through into the southwest. Those were the areas of the rapid price uh, appreciation, and they're the ones with a rapid deceleration. Uh, And that's, again, why I've been so concerned about the lower mainland and uh, and Vancouver, which really have led the the delusionary forces in Canada. I do think there's the greatest amount of downside there. BC taking a pounding last month, uh, house prices collapsing or house sales collapsing by 25 percent, 31 percent in Vancouver, the Okanagan, 23 uh, percent. It's bad news all across the board here. Yeah, it is. Uh, BC is really taking the brunt of this right now, or at least they're leading it. Uh, at this point. Uh, and I think people have to be very concerned who are homeowners in British Columbia. If you've been thinking about selling, well, you're going to s- still be able to find buyers now. The market hasn't collapsed. It, but you know where the first shoe has dropped, and that is that sales have gone down substantially. And people say, oh, Garth, you're full of it because prices haven't gone down yet. Well, no, they, they haven't. Prices stay sticky. S- home sellers, home buyers, uh, are in the driver's seat, but home sellers are defensive. Home sellers will take three, four, six months before they really decide, you know what, this is for real. The market's not bouncing back in the fall or it's now not bouncing back in the spring, and then they, they start to peel back prices. So it's going to take a while. That's why I say 2013 is going to be the year this issue really seizes the media's attention and therefore really seizes uh, the attention of pretty much everybody who's been a buyer or a seller. We're talking to Garth Turner from greaterfool.ca here on This Week in Money. Speaking of, media, of the uh, media, lots of real estate coverage last week in the media. CBC National uh, uh, was on all week. They had you on th- Thursday. On Friday, you were on CTV. What did you say and how much of what you were saying actually got on the air? Well, you know, it's, <laughs> that's interesting. What I've been saying is, you know, pretty consistent with the, uh, the stuff I've been talking to you about for the past year or two, Phil. So, you know, there's not a lot of news here other than the fact that things are actually kind of unfolding the way I thought they would. Um, It's a story the media now is discovering. Oh, my God, look at that. House prices don't go up forever. This is shocking. So it it is a story that's got legs right now as people start to see these sales declines. Um, which uh, they should have seen, but they didn't. Now, a lot of what I've said on the media obviously doesn't get on because it's not consistent with the storyline. Uh, for every time I stand up and say, well, you know, this is this is just what we should have expected based on the economic fundamentals, there's some industry economist trotted out saying, <laughs> well, you know, I don't think so. I think, uh, I think he's, he's, he's full of bunk or, he, you know, stop clock because right twice a day, the stuff they yeah. love saying about yeah. me. But you have to remember where most people are coming from. Uh, you know, I don't actually have anything to sell, so I just, I'm just i just a boy with an opinion. But you have to be careful when you get industry economists or people who work for the real estate board or people who work for a mortgage company. They're in positions of influence in terms of the public. They are quote-unquote experts. I think it's a bit irresponsible that their positions are not clearly stated. And a lot of what I've said, and I did a little interview on CTV the other day where I waxed eloquently about all the economic reasons why there's no sustainability to the market. And, of course, all the reasons were cut out, and we just went to the conclusion, which and then it's pretty easy to attack because one looks extreme. That's ah, fine. I'm comfortable looking extreme. It doesn't bother me. But I think that people need to know that there really is no clothing on the emperor. Yeah. The fact that we have supply that is overwhelming demand, we've got price multiples uh, that are way out of whack. Uh, You can rent a home now for substantially less than buying one in every major Canadian city. These are not ratios that give comfort. These are ratios that that foretell a market that's going to continue to go down. I love this quote, Garth, from a couple of blog posts ago. When house prices swell and bloat, getting risky and unaffordable, the media paints it as positive news. When sales sag and prices tank, nipping risk and making shelter more accessible. The pathetic bearded guy stating the obvious is talking bunk. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, we get it wrong. You know, let's look back at Nortel. Man, Nortel is 120 bucks. It's going to the moon. I want to buy it. 
And of course, when it goes uh, to nothing, there's a lesson. Rim, Rim was a hundred. Research Emotion was 150 bucks. Now it's six. Wow. Well, you know, if you wanted it at 150, maybe you want it better at six. But no, no, nobody wants it at all. A Vancouver single-family home detached uh, price was 1.2 million in the spring. Now it's gone down 200,000, and sales have tanked. Well, if people were so desperate to buy it at 1.2, why don't they want it at 200,000 less? This is human yeah, nature, yeah. and human nature is we want stuff that's popular. We run away from stuff that's unpopular, and people see rising prices as less risk and falling prices as more risk. Of course, it's the opposite. Interesting, Garth, that the uh, tone of the stories uh, on the media has changed. TV people obviously picking up on the sentiment out there instead of just drinking the real estate Kool-Aid. Yeah, and sentiment's the most important thing. Uh, Sentiment is the real mover of financial assets. It happens with everything, whether it's stocks or bonds or commodities, but most of all with residential real estate. It is the most emotional of assets and people buy and sell for very personal reasons. So when people start to see that real estate is, you know, more risky than it was before, or less chance of a of a gain, um, or they're afraid of the debt, then they'll back off. And uh, that's what we're we're seeing now. Very interesting development in the story. Garth Turner, our guest on this week in Money. I've got another quote here that uh, really puts it in perspective. The age of asset inflation is over. When your folks were growing up, real estate increased with economic growth. Pumping money into a house made sense because basically the capital value uh, kept pace with inflation. Now it yep. is a different story, but we're still in the old mindset. Yes, we are. Uh, it's astonishing how people cling to old beliefs. There are Tens, hundreds of billions of dollars, for example, in Canada stuck in GICs. And GICs are paying less than the rate of inflation, plus they're fully taxable. Mm-hmm. But, man, people are stuck in this mindset. That's where I need to put money to be safe and grow a little bit. And, of course, they're losing money. Same with real estate. People still have inflationary expectations about it. Um, Phil, I tend to think we're living in a borderline deflationary economy right now. Low growth, low rates. Um, low yield world and this is the world that's going to continue Mm -hmm. so the expectations have to be toned down Um, and especially uh, you know costs of real estate are only going to get higher in the future mortgage rates can't go lower than they than they really are Uh, lending standards are being toughened so all of this really intellectually should tell us that home ownership will become more difficult I think there's a much better future for people today in liquid assets. Um, there, you know, there's an insane fear of financial assets, stock markets uh, today, when stock markets really just pace economic growth and corporate profits. And there's more discernible growth in those areas than there is and there will be in real estate. Time to change our focus. Now, let's talk about that because that's something that uh, that you propound on the blog. And you get a lot of heat from the, the various blog dogs uh, about alternatives to real real estate. Yeah, that always happens. Yeah. Ever since 2008, people have been so rattled by what happened in 08, 09. They didn't see it coming. They should have, but they didn't. Uh, and it just rocked the belief that a lot of people have had in financial assets. Now they see conspiracies everywhere that the central banks are in cohorts with Goldman Sachs and they're all out to you know rob us. Uh, it's not the case. Financial markets have been seesawing higher. And if you take a look at a chart of the S&P 500 from 2008, 2009 until today um, and start drawing some lines on it, connect all the highs, connect all the lows, you will see the market is moving inexorably higher. There is no doubt about it. So it is a seesaw pattern. There is short-term volatility. But this is pacing the general recovery of the global economy. And I continue to believe it's going to get better. I think the United States is going to have a renaissance over the next four or five years. Despite all their debt woes, they will grow their way out of it. Europe is stabilizing. Commodity prices will firm up. I think it's going to be the opposite of what we see happening with uh, residential real estate in Canada, which is going to join what's happened to residential real estate around the rest of the world. So, you know, people need to understand this, especially baby boomers right now who have the bulk of their net worth in residential real estate. Uh, what they need is income, and they need cash flow. So this is, they're not going to get that from their houses. You summed it up very nicely in your blog a while ago, Garth. Rent what depreciates, buy what appreciates. The goal no longer to own a house, it's to be financially independent and liquid. 
Yeah, liquidity. I'm I'm big on that. I think going forward, it's the one thing you want in a portfolio. You don't want to get locked into GICs. You don't want to have most of your money in illiquid real estate. Mm -hmm. You want to be in more of a balance of financial assets. I'm a big believer in balance. I like having a portfolio that's got various types of, of, of bonds. It's got preferred shares, real estate investment trusts, ETFs. It's got a whole bunch of things in there that are going to give not only stability but growth. And overall, everything is liquid. Again, if you're worried about the world, cash is not a great alternative right now because cash is obviously not going to grow and most people don't have enough. And um, I think you want to have that liquidity from a portfolio that can be turned into cash in three days. So if there is a volatility, you can get around it and take advantage of opportunity. Author, blogger, financial advisor, and entrepreneur Garth Turner is our guest. You can find Garth on the web at greaterfool.ca. And don't forget Garth's latest book, Still Good Reading, Money Road, Tools for the Wild Ride Ahead. Hey, Garth, thanks for this. Pleasure as always, Phil. Thank you. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Sam Wyatt is a Vancouver realtor. When he's not climbing Mount Everest, he publishes a monthly market update on his blog at samwyatt.com. And you can also find him on Facebook. Hey, Sam, welcome to This Week in Money. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Got to ask you a question about Mount Everest, because it's not every day you get to talk to someone who's uh, been up and down Mount Everest. What was more challenging, the climb up or the, or the way down? Uh, well, the climb up was definitely the most challenging for me. The way down, you use a lot of less energy. Um, and breathing oxygen, it turned out I felt pretty great on the way down. So uh, it isn't always the case. I've had trouble on other big mountains okay. on the way down uh, where you're so tired, you're falling asleep at the wheel. So this time it went well. Going down was easier. So when are you going back up Mount Everest? Where are you going next? Well, I won't be going back to Mount Everest. It was actually my second attempt this spring, and uh, I've actually climbed a lot of other big peaks. Uh, I was on a total of four 8,000-meter expeditions wow. now. That's the end of that kind of climbing for me. I'll keep climbing big mountains, but uh, probably nothing bigger than 7,000 meters. Luckily, we're here in British Columbia, where there's lots of big mountains or medium-sized mountains yeah, to small climb. Mountains, yeah, small mountains. Yeah, compared to Everest, small mountains. <laughs> so now, if Vancouver real estate was a mountain, where are we on the mountain, and, and where do we go now? Well, it depends on how you look at it. I follow a metric uh, months of inventory, which is the, let's call it the theoretical amount of time it would take to sell all of the property that's on the market if nothing changed. And we take all of the active listings, and we divide that by the number of sales in the same month. And that gives us this months of inventory metric. And if we look at the mountain, we can say that months of inventory is getting higher and higher and higher. And that is very bad news, in particular for the detached west side market, which has been what's driven Vancouver pricing. So the mountain is getting bigger if you're looking at that kind of okay. uh, picture. We got news here from uh, CTV News. Vancouver's red-hot housing market, they're saying, has taken on a distinctive fall chill. And I'm not sure these numbers are, are correct, but they're saying there's an 18-month supply of houses in Richmond and where you specialize uh, in Vancouver's west side. A 13-month backlog. Is that accurate? Yeah, 13 months is definitely accurate for where we are, and I suspect it's going to be higher when we see September's numbers. It's been progressively getting higher now for six months in a row, and I suspect we'll see a seventh. So we're we're pretty much at a point of no return, I would say, for this market, you know, suddenly getting better. Um, I don't know how deep the, the pricing uh, fall will wind up being, but there's no doubt that it's going to happen. Sam, is Vancouver the canary in the coal mine here? Or is it an indicator for the rest of the country, do you think? It's a good question. You know, I, I would suspect that, yes, it is. Uh, but we have a pretty unique market. Um, most of the reason why this market has been driven up so high over the last couple of years, it, it may have started with first-time investors right after the credit crisis with the flood of cheap money, but those investor or those uh, first-time buyers quickly uh, quickly fell off, and what has driven this market has been a lot of foreign money coming in and buying the most costly real estate, and then folks selling that real estate have then uh, bought something a little less costly, and so it's been a top-down market. Now that the money uh, from mostly Chinese buyers has slowed down considerably. We couldn't say stopped completely, mm -hmm. but almost uh, a fraction of where it was. Now that that money stopped flowing, it's, it's really difficult to imagine why we'd carry on here. 
How that might affect other markets, I don't know. Maybe just the change in market and, and people's perception of market will, will uh, bring other markets down as well. What about this Wall Street Journal study of Asian buyers? They're saying the number one destination is still Canada, but obviously there's got to be ups and downs in, in those numbers. Yeah, who knows? I have no doubt that in the long run we'll continue to see money flow in from China. I think the trouble now is as the greater economic uh, global picture worsens, that the liquidity of money is is lower, and sure. therefore it's harder for Chinese uh, nationals to get money into Canada. It's difficult for them to take out mortgages here, so they need to buy with so-called cash. But my suspicion is uh, they're probably still borrowing uh, funds from someone uh, in order to make that happen, and those funds are likely uh, less available now than they were. Maybe that's why we're having the slowdown from them. We're talking to Sam Wyatt from samwyatt.com. Here on This Week in Money, we're talking about real estate in Vancouver, which is Sam's specialty. A lot of factors at play here. You covered the uh, the inventory one earlier and uh, something else that you mentioned. I don't think this is a factor, but obviously it has to be. Consumer confidence, it's lower than it used to be. What kind of effect does consumer confidence play in here, Sam? Well, that's certainly not something I'm expert at, but from what my own reading tells me, uh, uh, people's confidence gets lower when they have less money. And people's perceived wealth is often uh, in the value of their home. And so for a long time, we've had very high home values, and people have had huge amounts of equity in their homes. And so they feel like, oh, it's okay, I can go out and buy this, or I can go out and buy that. When prices start to fall, people are going to definitely feel less wealthy and feel in a more precarious position. Suddenly losing a job will seem like a, a much more desperate situation for people. So I have no doubt, again, that uh, the change in pricing in Vancouver is going to have an effect on people's spending habits. Now, those tighter mortgage rules, obviously a huge factor here that the government recently tightened up uh, eligibility to get a mortgage. That's obviously cut a lot of first-time buyers out of the market. What kind of effect has that had on, on, say, Vancouver's west side? I would think not much. Not much, yeah, exactly, because the truth is is that uh, most of those first-time home buyers aren't buying multi-million dollar homes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, that probably won't play a big role. One of the big changes, though, is that uh, you can't take a mortgage out that's over a million dollars now and have it CMHC approved. So that's uh, definitely uh, made it more difficult for people who maybe are trying to move up the food chain a little bit in terms of the house that they own. Um, Mostly, I think those rules, uh, the amortization rules, have probably had the biggest effect. Got a, a more news here from the Conference Board of Canada. They're saying, and, and there's a different point of view here, they're saying construction is headed for a bigger drop than the rest of the country. On the other hand, here's Peter Simpson. He's president and CEO of Greater Vancouver Home Builders Association, who says, no, that's not quite true. We don't expect, he says, any significant uh, reduction in activity. What are you seeing? <laughs> well, I'd be surprised if he'd say otherwise. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, they're in the business of building homes, and they would like to continue to imagine the market will be very rosy. And who knows? Maybe it will turn out to be, but all of the indicators suggest otherwise. Another another piece of news here, the Canadian Real Estate Association cutting its uh, 2012-2013 outlook, lowering its price forecast. But on the other hand, uh, here's BCREA's chief economist, Cameron Muir. He says, no, that's not quite true. We're expecting a rebound by the end of the year. Uh, and he figures the economy is going to pick up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not an economist. I don't know how the economy in general is going to do, and maybe it will do better. But I, I look at months of inventory and and it's it's going to have a psychological effect. Yeah. There's more than a thousand signs on on lawns ac- across just the west side of Vancouver alone. It really doesn't matter what happens to the economy. Just the sense of uh, that massive amount of inventory and not enough people buying is going to change house prices for sure. So give me a thumbnail sketch of of, of your area, which is Vancouver's west side, a beautiful place to live, a lovely uh, location, pretty expensive houses all in all. What's going on there, and, and what do you see happening in the future? Well, homes are generally stagnating, and, and prices are, in spite of the talk that prices are stable, prices, in fact, aren't stable. Prices are active prices, uh, active listing prices are falling even as sale prices stay fairly high because so few sales are taking place. And what I have found and what has been successful for my clients is pricing below what the previous sales comparables were. You need to aggressively price lower in order to get sold in this market. If your house doesn't look like a deal, nobody's buying. You mentioned only about a third of the listings actually selling, and it was uh, approximately, what, about 60% before? Yeah, that was a year-to-date figure uh, last month uh, for uh, sales 
sales success ratio. So it doesn't necessarily mean that those houses didn't sell. It means that the listings didn't sell. So they might have taken it off the market, sure. put it back on at a lower price. But those are staggering changes in, in numbers, definitely. Sam Wyatt from samwyatt.com, our guest here on This Week in Money. And besides pricing your home below what uh, other houses have sold for, what other advice can you give to, to sellers of real estate in Vancouver and BC generally? Well, all the I mean, that is the most crucial thing in this market is pricing right. Obviously, you can do all the other things. You need to uh, hire a competent realtor and you need to, uh, you know, make sure your home is in a condition that uh, people are going to come in and want to, to live there and buy it. But the simple truth is that this market is almost all uh, price driven at this moment. If your house isn't the great deal, uh, chances are someone's going to move on. There are too many others to look at. OK, if I'm a house seller now, what advice can you give me there? Well, if you know, if you want to, if you got three dogs and a and, and a, a tassel of kids, to, now may not be the time to sell. You know, you you need to live somewhere, and a house isn't necessarily an investment. It's where you you spend your time and where you live. But for those people who know that they want to sell in the next, uh, let's say, six months to uh, two years, now is the time. I wouldn't hesitate because the prices are falling, and the sooner that you sell, the the better that you will do. Sam Wyatt publishes a monthly market update on his blog, and you can catch it at samwyatt.com. You can also find Sam on Facebook. So let me spell Sam's last name for you, W-Y-A-T-T, just in case you uh, you missed me saying it the first time, samwyatt.com. Sam, it is a pleasure to talk to you, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you so much. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Robert Campbell wrote Timing the Real Estate Market. He publishes the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter. Hey, the September issue is out. Timing market signals for 17 major U.S. cities. You can find all that online at realestatetiming.com. Bob, welcome back to This Week in Money. Thank you for inviting me back. Couple of U.S. real estate trends in the news, home prices and mortgage rates. Let's start off with the home prices. Is the U.S. housing market recovering? Here's the Case-Shiller Composite showing a 1.5% jump in house prices in July. And the media, of course, all over this one. Give us a breakdown on what's going on with the case, Shelley. Well, and it's, you know, the, um, the, the, we are, in fact, in a housing recovery here in the United States. We hit bottom in the early part of 2012, um, and now things are rising. The, you know, all the markets, you know, using, using data that I use to track trends, which is accurate about 85% of the time, uh, you know, the U.S. housing market in general is rising. As my, and and the, in fact, the 17 cities that I follow, Phil, that uh, 17, 15 of the 17 are in rising trends, and only two are in falling trends. And with the new data, new data coming out, uh, the new data that was just released last week, I believe, um, or this week, in fact, that I think that's going to be turn into be 16 or 17. So all arrows point to higher prices. So Phoenix leading the rebound, I guess you could probably say there's nowhere to go but up in Phoenix. Yeah, because in Phoenix, the prices fell so far, especially relative to incomes and rents. Finally, what sparked that recovery there was all the, all the investors and speculators jumped into it, and that just, you know, higher prices fuel higher prices. And so now that's one of the, you know, on a year-over-year basis, that's one of the strongest U.S. housing markets. In fact, it may be the strongest major market. Market. Where else is doing well besides Phoenix, Bob? What else is doing well? Let me see. You're asking me to remember all these things. Um, <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, let me tell you what isn't doing well as well. The state of California, Los Angeles. Oh, I'll tell you what's doing well. San Francisco. Okay. San Francisco's doing well. Miami's doing well. And the, the two other cities in, San, in California, San Diego and Los Angeles, their, their, their improvement has been subpar to the rest of the nation. Now, you specialize in California. Why is that? What's going on in California? Well, I'm from California, you know, and, you know, the California is the biggest state, and real estate prices in California are generally a, uh, a major bellwether for the country as a whole. And so... And that's just where I started, and I just expanded out to the other, um, you know, you know, other cities throughout major cities throughout the, the country as well. We got to mention when we're talking about the uh, Case Shiller, we've got some uh, uh, quotes here from uh, Carl Case. He is the case in Case Shiller. Says we're at a bottom. He doesn't think we're going to come roaring out of here. And he talks about uh, the stuff you've been talking about as long as we've been well, together. The, you know, I, I, I think. I mean, it's been clear that the bottom's in. I, yeah. I think. I, I think uh, Case. Um, 
or, or, or the represent that speaker that uh, that talks about this. I think he's been too conservative in calling a, a trend reversal because um, you know there's, there's other there's other uh, 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 home price indexes besides Kay Schiller. In fact, Kay Schiller has the biggest lag because it's a, a three day, a three month moving average that's you know two months behind. That um, for example the um, Oh gosh, what is it? Uh, Zillow, Zillow turned uh, FHFA, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, that turned at the uh, at the start of the year. So that's what in, in the last in my last letter, Phil. That's what I used. I said, hey, it's not only Case Schiller that has upward momentum. These other price indexes, uh, you know, Clear Capital and a bunch of them. I think I showed four or five of them in that issue, and they they all had had turned you know, positive year over year at some time in 1912. So, the, the, you know, the evidence speaks for itself. The data speaks for itself. We are in a recovery. Now, the reason for this recovery, do I think it's organic? No. I think it's all, you know, a big function of, of market manipulation by the Fed, mm-hmm. you know, keeping interest rates at record lows and, uh, and uh, you know, preventing keeping the banks have, you know, 10 million distressed homes that it's estimated that, that they're not putting on the market out there because that would depress prices. But the, those guys can do that because their cost to carry is, is zero. And, you know, the banking regulators will let them get away from it because the, the, banksters, the banksters take care of the banksters. We're talking to Robert Campbell from the Real Estate Timing Letter here on This Week in Money. And uh, here's Robert Schiller. He's the Schiller in case Schiller. And he says, uh, sober up, folks. It's going to take at least a year of price increases to determine if He's there is a recovery. I very cautious, too. Yeah. See, I think, I think uh, the, and I respect Robert Schiller a lot. Um, and another guy I respect a lot is a, an economist named Gary Schiller. Have you heard of him? Mm-hmm. He, he still expects a 20% drop in prices. I just don't think it's going to happen. I mean, the only way that's going to happen is if we see interest rates reverse, you know, like go from 3 back to 6% or something like that, you know, then, you know, that's when all hell's going to break loose, Phil. We're talking to Robert Campbell about the Case Schiller Home Index. It is up 16 of the 20 cities measured, uh, showing a year-over-year advance. And as you mentioned earlier, Bob, a whole... Yeah, so in fact, Case Schiller, you yeah. know, it follows 20 cities, you know, that for the last, uh, for the last uh, three months, all 20 cities have shown month-over-month gains. Mm-hmm. And if you go back four months ago, uh, that uh, Detroit was the only one that show, showed a month-over-month loss. It's almost been four months in a row. So the evidence the data, the data is very clear. There is a recovery. Now, do I think this recovery is going to be a real one that really is a is a one that's going to be a, a big move? I don't, because I know its incomes are going down. Uh, incomes are going down, and um, that you know the only thing that keeps supporting you know these prices is the low interest rates. Bob, so, you... you know, if they keep dropping these interest rates, you know, the Fed engineered, you know, buying uh, mortgage-backed securities, and they just said, hey, the Fed just came out and said, you know, any of their purchases, any of their activities are now open-ended. Right, Phil? Yeah. That means that they'll do whatever they have to do. They'll print up as much money as they, ha- as they need to keep the system from imploding. You've said a number of times, Bob, that this recovery is basically bought and paid for by the Fed. Absolutely. Yeah. But it is a recovery, Phil. I mean, you've got to respect this at some point. Markets don't go straight down just like they don't go straight up. And I've had to convince, you know, talk to a lot of my very wealthy friends, and, you know, when I tell them that, they go, you're right, Bob. Yeah, markets do eventually hit a bottom at some point. And, you know, I kept people out of the market with my indicators, Phil, uh, for, almost, for, for six years. You know, that bump up for the tax credit, that I knew that was fake, and I told people not to buy into that. But this one, finally, they hit bottom, and I said, look, re- this is a recovery. You know, it is a recovery. Now you just have to decide, you know, how far prices are going to go up. And, and they're only going to go up as much as the Fed wants to engineer them to go up. Yeah. You know, keeping the stock market up, keeping, you know, confidence up keeping interest rates low. Now if they can just like lower the qualifications for getting a loan again, you know, they you know, this thing could could kind of take off cuz what they're really hoping, the Fed really wants is they want um, low interest rates to spark the housing market, which will stimulate the economy. And maybe people can start borrowing against their homes again to live a life they can't really afford. Yeah. Speaking of living a life you can't really afford, I always like to uh, get the National Association of Realtors involved here. Uh, they're saying sales of previously owned homes up 8% to last uh, compared to last year. Isn't, isn't 
that something? Yeah. You know, and, and, and I don't know how they're measuring it, but that's a key index there that, man, they just went zooming up. And that number was down from 9.3% only a month or two. So that, you know, it, it's the mix of houses that they're using. Okay. And maybe they are fudging the numbers, too. Would that surprise you? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking to Robert Campbell from the Real Estate Timing Letter here on This Week in Money. And we're talking about uh, the recovery in U.S. housing prices. What kind of things could uh, could impact the recovery, Bob? What would slow it down? Well, it, 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 what would reverse it completely is, is a, a turn in interest rates. That would certainly turn it, uh, turn it around. And the... The other thing that would turn it around, of course, that, you know, that a, a decline, a continued decline in the dollar because of the Fed's determination to uh, devalue it, you know, at some point in time, that's going to start raising, raising inflation fears, which is going to raise interest rates, and that could cause it too. But that's, that's, the biggest, that's the biggest fear out there right now, because that's what's supporting this move. There's no question about it. What about supply and demand, Bob? How's the supply of housing on the U- in the U.S. market these days? Well, you know, as, as determined by home sales, home sales have been in, trending up rather nicely. So that's a, that's a pure measure of supply and demand. And the housing market by itself, that, um, because there's been a restriction of supply, there's been two restrictions of supply. One, the, the banks don't have to put their REOs on the market. They can just keep holding them in their portfolio. And another big restriction on the supply is this. And I wrote about this, I think, uh, uh, an issue ago, Phil, as you recall. Mm-hmm. Um, something like, like, what is it, 20, 20% or something of all homeowners with a mortgage are underwater on their home. Wow. And what was interesting to me, of those people that are underwater on their home, 90% are still making the mortgage payment. That's inc- that surprised me. So of those 90%, so all those people that are underwater and they keep making mortgage payments, but even though they'd like to get out of those houses, sure. uh, they can't because they, they can't write a check. They can't write a check yeah. to cover the, you know, to cover what they owe for, for versus what they can get. So potentially, that's keeping a huge number of homes off the market just artificially. People keep making their payments, 90% of them, um, just because they don't want to lose their credit because that changes the dynamics of the move-up market because when, if they could sell these homes, they, they would buy something else. And that's, just, that's, that's preventing a, you know, a, uh, that, that, that presents a supply problem. Robert Campbell from the Real Estate Timing Letter with us on This Week in Money. One of the things you're writing about in the latest issue, Bob, the ratio of home prices to rents. Why is this important? When did it change? And what does it tell us about what's going on with housing? Oh, that, that's a great question, and that's a very key indicator for our, our readers to understand. That's a key metric for determining the direction of the housing market. Right now, as, um, as presented by Kay Schiller, who follows you know practically every small market all over the country, yeah. that, they, that according to their calculations, in 75% of all U.S. cities, if you factor in all the advantages of buying and the disadvantages, 75% in 75% of the instances, it is cheaper to buy a house today than rent a house. So that's, you know, rents, are, rents keep going up and housing payments keep going down. You know, they may start stabilizing somewhat with these monthly mortgage payments as, as house prices go, go, go higher. But right now, it pays to buy a house and, and live in it. And that's what I've been advising my, um, uh, my subscribers to do. You know, I said, look, if you don't own a house, everybody's going to have to live in something. Buy a house. Buy a house as long as you can afford it and live in it because it's cheaper. You know, everything considered, it's cheaper to own the thing today, you know, than it is rent. So that's, that's, a mark, that's a metric right there that's a huge driver, between, you know, behind this recovery. And, and you know, and, and my data is showing that, you know, that that's why the trends, the trends have moved up. Bob, tell me about your uh, five vital signs and uh, how those tell us that prices are going okay. up. Okay, that I developed a timing model uh, back about uh, over ten years ago, and it's based on five key indicators that uh, that forecast the market. You know, and in many cases they, they were leading indicators, and and the five key indicators are as follows: number one, existing home sales; number two new home building permits, number three, mortgage defaults, number four, foreclosure sales, and number five, interest rates. 
and, and I, com- I used all five of those key indicators into a, and put them into a formula, and it's weighted separately. Each one is weighted differently. But uh, they're, they're the key indicators that I use to measure, you know, trends in the, in the real estate market. And over the past, uh, since 1982, so we're talking about 30 years, wow. their accuracy rate is uh, right around 80, 85%. Okay. So when you're saying there's a recovery, you know what you're talking about. I, I, I believe I know what I'm talking okay. about, Phil. I'm a, I'm a data-driven individual because I know. Not only from, from my past experiences, but from my studies, people that use data to, to forecast future events are infinitely more successful in, in, in being right than those that do not. <laughs> even, even though the crystal ball can be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, I like being right. I, don't like, I like to make money in the markets, not lose money. We're talking to Robert Campbell from the Real Estate Timing Ladder here on This Week in Money. The other big story, uh, apart from the case Schiller, is mortgage rates. They have hit a low, record low again in the U.S. Uh, this is from Freddie Mac. The 30-year fixed rate falling to 3.4%. Unbelievable, huh? Wow. Yeah. You know what, Phil? It wouldn't surprise me one bit, one bit, if this goes, goes into, the, into the twos and maybe the two and a half. Because that's how determined that that that, that look this is, the Fed's running the show, right? Yeah, yeah. To keep the economy going, the only the only thing that they can control right now is interest rates, and they got to keep they got to keep dropping them. Hey, look, we could get into a Japan type situation. You know, you know what you know what long term you know mortgage rates are in Japan right now? Probably like zero. one and a half percent. Yeah. I mean, there's another there's another economy that's totally on on central bank uh, 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 life support, <laughs> and we and we could very well get into the same uh, the same situation. Mm-hmm. I don't think we will for the simple reason that the dollar is the world's reserve currency, and I think we're going to have and I think that that's going to change and that's going to change the whole thing for the United States. So when demand for the U.S. dollar falls. Boy, oh boy, that's yeah. when hell breaks loose. And what happens? That's when the deval- devaluation occurs. And what happens, Bob, when interest rates inexorably start to climb up again? Oh my God! I mean, they could go. Who knows? They could go sky high. Yeah. It depends on on how big the devaluation is. I mean, that they wouldn't stay up there forever, but they sure wipe out the economy while they got there until things return back to normal. So, we're gonna, so a crash of the dollar means high inflation to us. And high inflation would just kill us at this point in time, especially relative to the amount of debt that uh, and liabilities that not only the public sector has has taken on, you know, it's 17 trillion or so, but also the private sector. That's that's why the Fed absolutely cannot allow interest rates to go up because that would be just like a, a you know putting the gun in your mouth. Bob, always fascinated to get your take on the uh, U.S. real estate market. Tell us how we can subscribe to your uh, timing letter and what we get. Okay. You go to my website at realestatetiming.com, and you can, uh, you can see where there's a uh, – I, I, I give you a couple uh, sample issues to know what you're getting. And if you sign up for a year, uh, which is six issues – I publish once every two months, 10-page issues. The, uh, you get that, that subscription and a free copy of my book, Timing the Real Estate Market, that describes those key indicators that we talked about and how you can do it yourself, yourself, yourself if you want. And the price is $130 per year. Good money. Robert Campbell wrote Timing the Real Estate Market. He publishes the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter, and you can find out more at realestatetiming.com. Hey, Bob, always a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I enjoyed it, too, Phil. Thank you very much. Thanks to our guests, Garth Turner, Sam Wyatt, and Robert Campbell. And thanks to you for listening. I'm Phil Mackesy for AmericanManganeseInc.com. We're back next week with another edition of This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. 